Thoughts, Nick Fury, 1998, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. film. So, I am pretty much going to jump right into it. This video contains spoilers, and though it's a long video, there are time codes for different sections in the description box. Now, let's see. I originally... Wow. Okay, here we go. I knew the mouse wasn't completely dead. Oh, wow. You're going to be like that, are you? Okay, let's see. Right, I originally watched this back in 2009. And back then, I gave it a 1 out of 10. And I do think... I think this is one of those... There are definitely things about it that could be a lot better than they are, but there there are aspects of this film that, you know, if you could get into the style that it's going for, you know, clearly, maybe not everyone working on it, but at least a number of the people working on it, they really, they went for the the style that it was going for. You know, they didn't just half-ass, you know, I, I, f I unfortunately don't remember the the titles anymore, but there are some, you know, 80s and 90s sci-fi sci films where clearly they weren't even trying, you know, they just, they put out a movie because that was a way to, to make some money, they didn't have any specific, you know, they didn't have some vision that they really wanted the world to see. Where with this, I get the feeling that at least a number of the, you know, certainly, I'd say the writing and a lot of the acting, clearly they had an idea of what they wanted this to look like. And if you just, if you let yourself be, you know, if it's at all the kind of thing you can get into, I think it's decent. You know, my, my rating today, is 5 out of 10, both my film critic rating and my personal rating. Now, that did not sound good. Let's get into notes taken while watching. So. Honestly, if the style doesn't put you off, the opening scene is kind of suspenseful. You know, the undercover Hydra agent bringing Strucker back to life and then almost being caught by that one S.H.I.E.L.D. agent. And is this the guy they call Clay, the, you know, the, the agent who goes, let us rock and let us roll. It's a pretty daring last stand and he does manage to kill several Hydra just with a pistol in spite of all of them. Yeah. When Alexander Pierce enters the mine to find Fury, he sure must like living dangerously. Don't they have some kind of code, recognition code that they have later in the movie so that they can tell him they're the good guys so that he doesn't shoot one of them not knowing that? They're lucky he only uses martial arts instead of the gun that we see him grab against Pierce. The dialogue is arguably terrible, but at least they do really go for the style they're trying for. 90s sci-fi action sure did love them some the computers are malfunctioning jokes they're in this they're in Sylvester Stallone's Judge Dredd I seem to remember at least some in Demolition Man you know in addition to the the joke jokes in that movie about how the you know like the the swear jar you know robot computer thing yeah whatever I quite like Kate, the esp -er, and and Alexander Pierce, although I'm, I'm, I hope you won't find it too offensive when I say that I do prefer the MCU Alexander Pierce and Dum Dum Dugan and Fury himself, obviously, the, the various Hydra, you know, Zola, Baron Strucker, I feel like there's one more of the bad guys. 
I get yeah, maybe maybe that was with them. Now and like you know, Sylvester Stallone's Judge Red. This also has a gun that can only be fired by the person it's for. Now. I feel like I read some more that that's in the Judge Dredd comics. I haven't read the Judge Dredd comics, although it's, I did read the one where he fights. Is it an alien or is it? I believe it's an alien. It's a predator. Sorry, I read every single every comic I could get my hands on that has the alien, the predator, or both. And one of them was Judge Dredd versus a predator, which makes a decent you know amount of sense and. If, if you at all read comics and you love the original Predator movie, there's like a, a comic book made of the original concept for Predator 2, which is the basically, well, originally, originally, it was, wait, no, actually, you know what, I, I don't remember the exact detail. Anyway, the comic itself, it's Dutch's brother. And it is set in like Los Angeles or something, you know, a big, big city. And yeah, it's, I don't think it would really have worked as a movie, but it's, it's a very fun story now. But yeah, I, I forget if it's in the Marvel comics as well. The, the gun that can only be fired by the person it's for. Or if they made that up for this movie and I can't the LMD I mean that's 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 kind of cool this Terminator skull and they you know the, the rubber face spread over the skull and then they have to stick in like microprocessors or something through the ears and nose very creepy and yeah they even you know if you read the comics, you might have guessed, but they even spell out, yes, these are the life model decoys, you know, and the, the LMDs, which are, yeah, in, in the comics, and it's briefly referenced in the first Avengers movie, and it's like, if, you know, if you don't know that it's from the comics, it's, you know, it's a funny joke, but you don't get the, the further, but when, when, let's see... Coulson, when Agent Coulson is calling Stark, you know, he answers the phone and he's like, this is the life model decoy of Tony Stark, and, you know, if you've never read a comic, you still know, ah, oh, he's saying that it's like, you know, it's not really Stark, but but if you read the comic, it's like, ah, oh, life model decoy, I remember those. I, I don't, I would be surprised if a life model decoy shows up in the MCU, but, uh, yeah. And, you know, first Fury says, not a bad looking guy, huh? And then the LMD repeats it back, and uh, yeah. Andrea von Strucker really sells her performance. And this is also, you know, I've watched the, the second Mortal Kombat movie. I mean, I've, it's not really her fault in that movie, but... Yeah, in, in that movie, she's nowhere near as fun to watch as this. Although, to be fair, that one also has some cheesy performances. See, if I was going to watch the, the... I used to have a DVD of the first Mortal Kombat movie, but I don't know where it went. And so... so, But, but yeah, the, the if I was going to watch one of those movies... I mean, the first one is a lot less cringe-inducing, but at least the second one, the martial arts actually move fast. It's really surprising to me when I learned that the several of the major, like like the, ah, I'm sorry, I don't remember his name, the 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 Bruce Lee type. I, I don't I don't really know the games, but the he was actually modeled on Bruce Lee. You know the he is an actual martial artist in real life, and I think the Johnny Cage actor is as well. So it's like, why are the fights, why do they move so slowly then? It's not as though there weren't movies that had fast-moving martial arts when, when that movie came out. But yeah, anyway. And Andrea points to the screens with her pinky and we see that she's got this ring with the, the big red gem on it. And not long after this scene, we... You know, we, we see it when it turns out she was posing as that 
Interpol, I want to say, agent in Berlin, and I think it makes for a decent reveal. You know, she's he's like, who's who's the double agent? And she puts her hand up to his face and says, mine. And yeah, the 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 moment the ring comes into view, and most likely she put that on between walking up there and Fury joining her up there. You know, if she was wearing it the rest of the time, you know, excuse me, that would be. Although I don't know if the I'm not entirely certain if the characters in the movie know at that point that she has that. But it might have been when, you know, she, she says, she talks directly to the, you know, she talks to Fury through the, the eye camera thing of the, of, of Clay. So, yeah. I, I mean, that's, you got to admit, that's the kind of, like, the guy in front of her is dead or dying. So what makes the most sense to to taunt him and and kind of flaunt your victory for him, or knowing that he has these eye cameras to taunt your main enemy, who you know is going to be watching this footage? You know she she knew Fury well enough that the death of Clay would, yeah. We never got an explanation for why he was stuck babysitting the frozen... I'm not, I'm not going to dignify the popsicle joke with by repeating it, but, you know, I mean, I feel like I'm... You know, the... the there, are, there are problems with the movie Punisher Warzone, but at least it does bother explaining, you know, the... the is that a spoiler? There's someone who has like a crap job and over at, at one point in that movie it's explained this is why he got that crap job and it's actually like a character moment a plot point so yeah I, th I think that would have been good to have here as well anyway just make sure you pick the right wall yeah wow and yeah so you know, the, the double agent, yeah, she, she tells Fury, you know, can, can we talk somewhere, you know, alone? And, you know, she, she goes up the stairs, and then he comes up, and, you know, we see her legs, and she's wearing, like, what are those called? <sighs> Pantyhose, wed hose, or something, I, I don't, yeah. And then she's, like, flirting with Fury. And then after zapping him, which is, yeah, that's, that's what the ring is actually for. It's not just, like, decorative. It, it holds, like, an electric kind of thing, and she zaps the, the side of his head with it. Which is, again, like, you know, when you first see it, it's like, oh, wow, that's tacky, but whatever. And then the second time you see it, no, no, it's, it's a tool. You know, and because it's a ring, it's, you know, it, when, if, if you just see someone with a ring lift their hand, you know, it's like, oh, okay, that's that's a ring, that's a hand. But if they were, like, you know, taking something out of, from a pocket or something, you'd be like, oh, wait, what's that? You know, so so she has that ready, but, yeah. You know, she zaps him, then she mounts him, and then she kisses him. Yeah, this was definitely on TV in the 90s. I, I you know, I, I think there's a... Several of those things are probably true of other things that Lisa Rinna and and or David Hasselhoff were, were in, in in the 90s. Yeah You know back then the it was it was not as easy to find like you know I guess yeah, just, you know, th this was the, the age of, of Skinamax and, and such. Anyway, budget limitations aside, I do appreciate that this does have the helicarrier, even if, you know, almost every single time we see the exterior, it's from the same several seconds that they did. And I do think the androids in this are kind of cool, you know, like, like David Spade on Eight Simple Rules. You know, the, the thing melts after delivering the message. That's, yeah. And Agent 
and then it runs through the, the yeah, the, the Interpol agent has been infected and we see, you know, her, her face is all messed up from it and she screams in agony, like really, yeah, getting across. It's, it's serious, you know, the, they managed, you know, not, not only did they double this young woman, but they managed to, you know, they, they didn't just kidnap her so they could double her. They also had the, the you know, they, they also infected her just to show that, you know, how, how effective it is. And, I mean, they, know, they knew the, the recognition code, too. And they were there at the exact right time. And the Hydra guy, that was a plant so that they would trust her more. You see, she must be a good guy. She shot that, you know, yeah, that, that one Hydra agent that I, I, I do think it would have been nice if they explained why they all have this really pale face. And aren't they all also bald and have no facial hair? I, if that's from the comics, I, it's not something I offhand recognize. But, I mean, it is like... Like, did they, they all come out of a lab, or is there some kind, do, do they have to undergo some procedure for, before they're hired for Hydra or something? I just think it's, I, I like the decision, I just wish they, that there was some kind of exposition about the decision. Now, and it was just a decoy truck, and it looks as though they were killed in the plane explosion. We get a couple of Dutch angles as they approach the base. So they have a spray that can undisguise your face, and they have a spray that can cut a hole in a laser grid. That, again, like 80s and 90s, their ideas of like sci-fi gadget tech. You know, I mean, when when you look at once we get past like. The year 2000, you know, the early to mid to late 2000s, we have, you know, you, you have gadgets in, like, you know, MCU movies, but they tend to be a bit more credible. The, yeah, anyway. And... And we have the, the cliche, I, f I forget the, the, the Countess, Val. You know, she, she's like, just because you're, I, I know this isn't the, the actual line, just because you're not hearing from him doesn't mean he's not doing what we need him to. Let's give him a little more time so that he can accomplish it. You know, just, yeah, the, this, this really did not shy away from cliches. And this time Alexander Pierce did manage to knock the guard out, and he's really excited about that. And the... Yeah, the one Hydragoon, you know, he's like bouncing this ball, so when the grenade lands near his feet, he thinks that it's the ball and picks it up, and yeah. Nice little setup and payoff. Let's see. And the door opens, and Alexander and Kate get in just in time. Now, earlier we saw how much it hurt Kate when she read Zola's mind, so, you know, now she's like pausing before reading Andrea's mind, it makes sense, and... She doesn't get the numbers the first time, but Fury encourages her. You know, she can, you can do it, and you know, so she tries again. And it's also, I do appreciate also, like over the course of this, Fury changes his opinion about both Pierce and Kate, and also, you know, Val. The they they. They grow somewhat closer over the course of this, but you know when when yeah when when he first meets Pierce, he's not very impressed. When he first meets Kate, you know she like she says, "I have implants," and he he's thinking you know plastic surgery, and she's like neural implants, and you know I know what you're thinking. I don't need ESP to know what you're thinking, you know, he, yeah, let's see, and we also have, you know, it's a nine, not a six, and Andrea smiles as they almost get the code wrong, 
And of course, they only get there at the very last second. And we have several of these. Is it a nine? Is it a six? We, you know, back and forth. Let's see. You know, completely randomly. I didn't plan this, but just yesterday I rewatched Mission Impossible Fallout. And it's nice to see how far we've come in, in 20 years. And then, of course, also you have the, the fact that this is a TV movie and that's a huge summer blockbuster. But... Yeah. Now, let's see. And Andrea escapes. And so, the ending. Andrea. Andrea survived the movie. Her brother didn't. And a bunch of Hydra goons also ended up dead. And her father is now alive and moving around. If this had been picked up, had become a TV series, this ending would get me interested in what they'll do the next time we see them. You know, we've had set up that the Baron is a powerful enemy. Fury genuinely believed that he had defeated Hydra when he took out the Baron, and genuinely believed that the Baron was dead. I'm not sure it was ever said, but I guess the reason they didn't kill the Baron was that the virus was in his blood, and they're not sure they could dispose of his body in a way that wouldn't release the virus. That's really the only thing I can I can think of. Otherwise, it's just, you know, he's he's alive because the plot needs him to, but... Yeah, I do think that, you know, for, for most of the movie, we kind of just assume, well, you know, they can't bring him back to life. He's, but, you know, his blood has the, the virus, so, yeah, and it still does. I mean, if, there had, if they had appeared in a later episode or something, they would still have had that virus. They just might not have had the the same kind of... You know, they, they, it was a very coordinated effort in this one. They, you know, the, there's the virus, there are several decoy trucks, there's the, the missiles and the launching system and all that. So, yeah, the, the, let's see, I guess, let's see. Yeah, you know, so they, they still have the, the virus, although... It's possible that the the writers would have come up with some other means, but anyway, yeah, you know, at at the end, he is brought back to life, and you know, Zola said, "You you're as ruthless as your father is," and you know, yeah, like she's she's the second generation, but he's OG. You know, this is genuinely like. He, yeah, this this could be a, you know, he's, he's, with him by her side, the, you know, Hydra is much, much more capable than we've seen them in this episode. And the, yeah, it's, you know, considering some of the stuff that we did get, that, that did get TV shows in the 90s, it's, Almost a wonder that this didn't. But then, you know, it was a very dark period for, for comic book live-action adaptations. You know, movies and TV shows alike. So, anyway. Now, I have not really read any solo S.H.I.E.L.D. or Nick Fury. I've only read stories where he and or they appeared in other titles. Now, I did watch Baywatch and Baywatch Nights because there was very little on TV in the 90s. I think I watched Knight Rider. I don't remember. I did watch Knight... Team Knight Rider, which, you know, now that I know much better, I and I look back, oh, wow, that was definitely not as good of a show as Knight Rider, but it had, like, five different vehicles all with like robot personalities that would talk back and yeah yeah honestly I, I I wouldn't rule out watching something like that today and I, I did watch the the reboot I guess yeah yeah reboot pretty sure it was a reboot in 2008 I think it was of Knight Rider which I think it got a full season and then didn't get renewed and it was it was okay, you know. I mean, there were definitely some things in there that were, you know, that could have been interesting. But, yeah. Anyway. 
but yeah, so I have seen David Hasselhoff outside of this, and I really appreciate that David Hasselhoff got to appear in the MCU as well, to sort of, uh, I don't know if you want to call that an apology for this movie, or if you just, but I, yeah, I, th I quite like that. And I'm not going to give away exactly where it is and what movie it is, for those who haven't watched. Now, there's a 3 minute 39 second trailer, quote unquote, on YouTube. And I'm like, this is the trailer? It's essentially the movie edited down to a few minutes. It gives away major plot points. I really don't know, but I mean, I don't know. It's been a long time since I watched... <sighs> you know, a trailer or a TV ad for something that was on TV in the 90s, so it's possible that they all looked like that back then. I, I don't remember. Now, the this is listed as two hours on IMDb. Now, I guess that's with commercials and, you know, the, yeah, the DVD is 90 minutes and yeah, I, I don't know what the difference is between these versions, if there is one. Maybe it is just ad breaks. This is the only version I've watched. So. Now, that brings us to MDB, Wikipedia, and Critics Sites. Now, my old IMDB review, I give it a 1 out of 10. I'm not going to read everything in this out loud. I'm just going to briefly see what of it that if there's anything that I do want to read aloud. Let's see. And yeah, I read that, you know, the characters are just stereotypes, which I do genuinely if they had gotten more episodes, maybe they would have been able to flesh them out some more. I mean, that is, you know, I don't know, I get, yeah, it's a, it's a good thing if you, in the pilot episode, can give a, a decent sense of who this character is. But, you know, obviously they, you know, you, you expect fleshing out in later episodes. Let's see. And yeah, I know that it's campy and cheesy B grade. And it's as respectful of the comics as Schumacher and the 60s Batman. Let's see. And I found out the hideously overdone German accents. Yeah, I know that David Hasselhoff wasn't the worst possible choice. The fights are relatively dull. The effects are unimpressive. And again, in the in the actual, I realize this is you know late '90s TV budget, but I have seen better from that. Yeah, I. I but it's been too long for me to give exact examples. Now that I think about it, it's been it's been a lot of times. So yeah, and yeah, and I know appreciate. I get to see the helicarrier. Now, 
This is a review from a website. Felix Vasquez um, appears to be the name from 2017. Now, Yeah, he points out, you know, starring David Hasselhoff, cast by virtue of the fact that he looks like classic Nick Fury and nothing more. You know, if, if you don't really know the comics, before, I think it was 2000, 2000 or 2001, they made a new Nick Fury and they based him on Sam Jackson. So, yeah, when, when 1998 Nick Fury looked like David Hasselhoff, that wasn't them turning a black character white. That was that was the way the tradition that was the way he looked back then. You know, I'm I wouldn't completely rule out that the the that people not liking this may have been part of the reason that they were like, okay, we gotta people are laughing their asses off at our Nick Fury. Can we do some let's let's make a new one and let's make him completely different because you know David Hasselhoff, sometimes he's cool, sometimes he's not. But Sam Jackson, he's just cool. He is permanently cool, so yeah. Let's see. And... Fox had the foresight to turn the idea of S.H.I.E.L.D. into something of a team spy show, much in the vein of Mission Impossible, long before ABC did. And while the series never took off, you have to appreciate their ambition in taking what was seen, what was then an obscure element of the Marvel Universe and molding it to fit a weekly action series. And, yeah, I... That is... That is... Yeah. And I can, I can see... How they thought it might work because again if you just if you look at comic books especially like some of the older ones you know the if, if you look at like 2000s ones they, they work hard to be taken seriously but yeah if you go further back yeah you do have ridiculous gadgets and you do have these really cheesy and corny kind of things so yeah I mean they looked at the comic and they figured, well, I mean, this is the this is the way that the fans would want it, right? This is the way that, you know, and and the let's see, I mean, I, I don't know for sure, but I I remember someone saying that the the reason that the Batman '60s TV show was so campy was that that was the way the comic books were in the 60s rather than them like just not being able to take the the concept seriously they thought they they felt they were doing justice to it and it's possible i i don't know for sure but yeah now Veteran TV director Rod Hardy and writer David S. Goyer turned the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. into a decidedly roughneck group of ragtag super spies, a la 18 with a dose of Airwolf. I haven't watched Airwolf, but yeah, that, that's definitely true. There's definitely some, some A-team going on. And... During the late 90s, with Marvel selling every property they could, Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. had potential for something of an over-the-top but enjoyable series where the Hoff could ham it up as the old war dog. If anything, the biggest flaw to Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. is that writer Goyer turns Nick into a pseudo-snake Pliskin. Hasselhoff seems to be playing more toward Kurt Russell than an old army veteran, and Fury is even given a contrived motivation in the plot like Pliskin. Let's see. And that is that is a little strange. The, the yeah, the the whole thing with him so so resistant to going back when 
really it could have just... I mean, I guess they... they Goyer felt that there needed to be some conflict, and he wanted there to be conflict between... You know, in, in the 80s and 90s, if, if one of the antagonists, not necessarily the main bad guy, but if one of the, the guys standing in the way of the good guy was like someone with, with some kind of, of power and influence who didn't understand how bad things were, or who didn't like that the hero was such a cowboy, you know, yeah, you pretty much had a winner. Now, Nick Fury, agent of S.H.I.E.L.D., is unabashedly silly and relies a lot on camp when it could have been a stern spy thriller with Hasloff taking a more dramatic angle as the show's titular hero. In spite of that, though, Nick Fury, agent of S.H.I.E.L.D., is at least ambitious and very sleek looking. And star David Hasloff seems to be having a ball playing the cigar chopping spy who probably roll his eyes at Spider Man and challenge Captain America to a drinking contest. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the performance by Sandra Hess, who is sexy as well as Viper, who looks like she was lifted right out of a 1930s movie serial. Very true. I. That, that really. Yeah. Let's see. I also, uh, you know, basically just because, you know, I looked through the, the movie connections list for this on IMDb, and I saw Sky Captain and The World of Tomorrow was there. And I hadn't really thought about it, but then I saw, well, you know, technically, yeah, technically, you know, Angelina Jolie has an eye patch and, an, and a heli, you know, heli base. Helicarrier, like in this movie, and I hadn't really thought about it, but yeah, you know, a more, again, going by a kind of more classic style, more, you know, it, it was, that movie is basically the future as it was predicted in the 30s and 40s, you know, the, that was what back then they thought that the future would look like with these giant robots and you know the the that gun that can melt steel and these various things and yeah it makes a lot of sense to to take to to put someone like Nick Fury and the the helicarrier in there it's, yeah that that really does That's, it's not really, it's not a movie I love, but I do really respect the ambition of it. And I do think there are a lot of designs in there. I mean, yeah, basically the, the, the thing to me is that it never completely looks like the, 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 char the, the live action elements and the CG coexist completely. You know, it's, there's always, you can always tell when you're looking at, you're you're looking at one or the other, and yeah, I I I kind of wish that they would remake it or or I guess maybe reboot or something today where the you know today's CGI is convincing enough for it. You know, you look at some of the yeah, for example, MCU movies. You know, the the CGI is amazing, and there are things that. You watch them and you believe them, and then later you're told that was CG. Now, let's see. You have to wonder how different today's live action comic book landscape would look if Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D., took off as a hit series, don't you? And yeah, that it would definitely be a very different, yeah. I mean, that is part of, I mean, I don't know when this aired compared to when Blade hits theaters, but 
And I realize, you know, not, not everybody thinks of Blade as a comic book, you know, adaptation, although it is one of those things, you know, if you stop to think about it, yeah, it's, it's a comic book concept, you know, a, a vampire hunter who's part vampire himself, that's, you know, today, that's from a comic book, you know, if you go back far enough, it's from, like, a, yeah, anyway, the, the, let's see, you know, the, the, yeah, Blade is obvious that that was, yeah, I'm, I'm glad we, we didn't, you know, after some years, we, we stopped making every single comic book movie like that, but, yeah, for a while, that was way more what people wanted, even though both of them have black leather and, you know, over-sexualized female characters, and just, yeah. But the, the first several years after that, you know, outside of Spider-Man, you know, but, yeah, Blade, X-Men, The Matrix, although technically it's not, I mean, it's in part a comic book, but it's also in part anime and a million other different genres, but, yeah, and then we, you know, let's see, but yeah, Spider-Man was an exception, and then once, yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that, you know, they didn't feel the need to put characters like, you know, I mean, I guess, excuse me, Iron Man and Hulk wouldn't have been in leather, but you could, you could imagine them putting Thor in something, you know, ridiculous, where really, I mean, it has the, the look from, from the comic, and just, I don't know, I, f I feel like the, the various things they put Thor in, they tend to look convincing as this sort of, you know, royal regalia kind of thing, and then also, you know, somewhat of a, what's it called, like a uniform, armor kind of thing. Now, there is, let's see, Rotten Tomatoes. There's no, no tomato meter, but 16% of audiences liked it. 750 user ratings, average rating of 2.2 out of 5. Now, excuse me. The, yeah, so user reviews. Okay, let's see, there's a total of five pages. I'm not going to read every single one, but... Excuse me. There we go. Ridiculous, but the camp actually works most of the time. Shockingly, this ill-conceived Marvel adaptation, which aired on Fox Network in 1998, was written by David Goyer, who co-wrote the Dark Knight trilogy. Yeah, that really is. Like, David Goyer, really, it's unreal, the, the kind of... He's helped write some of the best live-action adaptations of comics and some of the worst. It's, it's very... Yeah. Let's see. And Hasselhoff is fun in this, but the rest of the characters are barely memorable outside Lady Viper. And What is this garbage? Uh, 
a lot of fun if you don't want to take your heroes seriously. Ah, excuse me, I still have back issues. The direction, the directing is boring and one-dimensional. I think that is, yeah, I, I, I think maybe the, the director didn't really believe in the, maybe he felt like it was just a paycheck to him or something. I, th I think I read that he also did X-Files and I haven't watched very much X-Files at all, but as far as I recall, X-Files takes itself a lot more seriously than this does. So maybe he feels that, maybe he's more attracted to things that take themselves more seriously. I, I could definitely imagine, you know, if you're working on this and you think that it's completely the wrong tone, yeah, it would definitely be very, very, just, yeah. I, I could understand why you would only, you know, why you would get get it over with as quickly as possible. Let's see. Is that the same? This guy says it's the same Viper character from the Wolverine? I think it's a different Viper character. Isn't it? I mean... Hasn't Viper always been Hydra? And there's barely any Hydra in the X-Men film series. Like, you know... Technically Deadpool 1 has that one character who at least in the comics is Hydra. But in the movie, he's not really. Yeah. Any, anyway, maybe I. I haven't looked up if that's the case. You know what? I guess I could just real quick see if that's. Let's see. I guess the. I guess the quickest way would be to open the Wolverine on Wikipedia and look up what it says under Viper. I don't know, I just, I... Why would they have a character so... Because Viper is from S.H.I.E.L.D. in the comics as well, I think. So the... Anyway, let's see. Okay, this one is called Doc. Yeah, Doctor Green slash. Vi Never mind. The film does not reference Viper's co comic book history as an agent of Hydra due to rights issues with Marvel Studios. Fair enough. I guess she is. Wow. Yeah, that is that is a very different. Now I kind of want someone to recut, like, every every Viper speech in this with, like, shots of Hugh Jackman's Wolverine reacting to her. Anyway, yeah, if, if you're watching this and that's something you could do, please do that and send me the link. That would be, that would, yeah, be a lot of fun. Let's see. Written by David A. Scorner, the writer would go on to do Blade. That's actually, yeah, he wrote that and he wrote this. So clearly it's not, yeah, he genuinely thought that that would be, you know, I don't know, it's possible that someone told him what, you know, tone to go with. But other than that, this is the, excuse me. 
yeah, this is this is the it's the same year. I'm almost certain Blade came out in '98, not '99. And even so, it would only be one year. So it's yeah. Anyway, let's see. Excuse me. Think of Hoff as the 80s version of William Shatner, minus the Star Trek connection. Think Arnold Schwarzenegger's Commando with a Marvel Comics twist. Let's see, what people seem to forget when it comes to this film is that it is extremely loyal to the source material and in some ways feels like a precursor to the new Marvel movement. See, previous Marvel films had been disasters and the property seemed cursed with films like 1999's The Punisher, 1990's Captain America, 1986's Howard the Duck. Yeah, I didn't watch the first of those two, but Howard the Duck, wow, they, yeah. That movie, yeah. It wasn't until really the success of Blade and Sony's 2000s Spider-Man film that it all slowly started to change. Let's see. 1997, when Goyer sat down to write both, both Blade and Nick Fury, he really dove into the source material. Comic fan himself, he knew that if you stay close to the source, then the concept will work. When I actually sat down and revisited Nick Fury, I was shocked. The movie isn't really all that bad. You have Nick Fury facing off against Baron von Strucker, well, his twisted offspring. It is a vintage S.H.I.E.L.D. versus Hydra struggle. Let's see. And he identifies Lisa Rinna as Soap Vet. Excuse me. And I'm just going to skip through. You know, the, the reviews are online. You can read them. I'm only going to highlight some things and maybe argue against ones. The... The filming during the, the action and sort of the staging of the action is a little unimpressive and definitely could have been, like, it really doesn't, you know, the, the 90s 
didn't let's see. you know you, you could have good action on TV shows so it's not that yeah let's see And on to IMDb stuff. Let's see. And you know the the movie connections points out that Obscurus Lupa did a video on it. But it's listed as a movie nights episode when it, it it's Obscure's Loop of Percents, but she put it up on the same channel as, as movie nights. But technically, I mean, on IMDb, the th yeah, you know, it it it's the same person who did you know the the person who runs the channel is the person who did that video back when it was yeah. And let's see. Let's see. There's a excuse me. There's a Watch Mojo video. Top ten super embarrassing super horror movies, where this movie is number eight on the countdown. And let's see. There's not really any. Right, now, on to Wikipedia, and this one is quite short. Like, clearly some people really wanted to put information up there, but there's also ultimately not that much. Let's see. Actually, I guess it's possible that they wouldn't be able to make the Death's Head virus again. They reconstituted it from the Baron's blood, but that was Zola who did that, and he dies when he tries to fire Fury's gun. So they might not be able to create the virus again. I, I definitely do think it would be interesting if they came up with something else for the later yeah but i could definitely see like excuse me hydra as sort of an ongoing you know maybe not necessarily every episode i think that would get to be tedious but you know every several episodes they would reappear and you know maybe it would be like maybe each time it would be that there was some kind of you know, undercover agent, that, like how this starts. You know, the first thing we see is a Hydra double agent. I, yeah, I think that could have been a cool now. You know, certainly the, you know, the, the main base and several of the Let's see. What's it called? 
you know, the yeah, Hydra's main base was taken, and a bunch of their men were stopped by S.H.I.E.L.D. You know, one of the two siblings died, Zola died, so it, it is, you know, yeah, the, the, and they didn't, they didn't manage to escape with the missiles either, so they couldn't use those another time. You know, so yeah, the next time you met them, it could be that they don't have as many resources or they haven't had as much time to build up the plan. Now, let's see. I do, like, Neil Roberts, you know, from Charmed, I, I like seeing him in this. Let's see. Now, the, yeah, there's this listing called Differences from the Comic. In the comics, Dugan has red hair, mustache, and a bowler hat. None are present in the movie. Considering that several S.H.I.E.L.D. agents in this are wearing tight black leather, you almost have to wonder why they didn't give Dugan those, you know, one or more of those three things. But I guess it would have been, it wouldn't have fit quite with the, the same vision that they had for the rest of this, but... I mean, running around in black leather as a, like, you know, the fact that it's black makes sense, but, you know, do you really want to fight wearing leather? As, yeah. The, and I appreciate that this is equal opportunity, you know. There are both men and women wearing tight black leather. You know, the, the, anyone who's into dudes... You've got Hasselhoff wearing leather. Anyone who's into chicks, you've got Lisa Rinna in black leather. Now, and that is, again, somewhere I really appreciate that, you know, Captain America, the first Avenger, yeah, Dugan looks the, yeah, he's got the, the hat, the, the hair and the mustache, so, yeah. And it, it is really funny to watch this today and like compared to all the MCU, you know, all the all the characters that are in this that are also in the MCU, that, yeah, you know, Nick Fury, Alexander Pierce, Zola, Baron von Strucker, the, let's see, yeah, Dugan, I guess those are, those are them, but yeah, all of those characters actually also appear in the MCU, and it's, uh, yeah. And... Yeah, and as points out, Hydra agents appear with black men in black type suits rather than the green uniform from the comics. I do think that would, that would have been too, I mean, too far, no, I, ultimately I do think that would have been, that might have been the, the, like the, you know, the, the straw. Although I, I really, uh, technically there's, there, this one does have a straw. In fact, it probably has many straws. If, does that even make sense by using that phrase, saying more than one straw? Anyway, the, the, um, right. But yeah, if, you know, if you don't know, you know, Google in like, you know, Hy Hydra agent in, in comic, and yeah, the, the green uniforms, that, oof, that would, that's, that's a lot. Now, let's see. This is, Andrea was codenamed Viper. Didn't they call her Viper in the movie? I think they did. At least once they, they said, uh, they referred to her as the Viper or something. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, some of these, okay, then it says, you know, there's this character that's combined with someone else. You've got the Hydra suits, uniforms. And then they say, you know, Andrea has a twin brother named Andreas, who did not appear. And the, and they have a younger brother named Werner in the comics. The twins have an older half, 
older half-brother named Werner. But then it says Andrea was codenamed Viper. Maybe that's... I think she's in both. I mean, yeah, I'm not sure I, I'm reading that right. And then it says Dr. Arnim Zola appeared as an elderly hydrochemist responsible for the creation of the Death's Head virus. I mean, I'm not sure he's a chemist in the comics, but he is a scientist working for Hydra. Yeah, anyway. Let's see. And... Now, only September 30th, 2008, the DVD came out. That's really, like, a full 10 years. I mean, it's not that bad. It's not so bad that you wouldn't... I don't know. I, I mean, I could see how a lot of, you know, not necessarily very many people would buy it. And September 2000... Yeah, that would be after the release of the first Iron Man movie. And S.H.I.E.L.D. do appear briefly in The Incredible Hulk also. So... Yeah, I guess they were hoping. I mean, I know that when, you know, when the 2003 Hulk movie came out, Blockbuster stocked the, the TV series, you know, the, the 1978 is when it started. I'm pretty sure is when it started. You know, 1970s TV show. And they, they put the, the, like, the cover of it had... A very similar image to the the 2003 movie. So me and a friend of mine almost rented like episodes of the show, and like I don't know if she had maybe she had encountered others who had made that mistake, but she was like, you know, this is the TV show. This is not the new the movie that just came out, right? And we were like, oh wow! And we walked back and put the the you know got got ourselves the the right one. I think technically it did say, but it wasn't very clear that it was the TV show. And it's like, I mean, just, you know, put like image, one or more images from the actual show instead of putting, I mean, it was, it was definitely, I will bet money. It was definitely not the, the painted green face of, I can't remember his name right now, but I, I know the, the, you know, the, the guy who played Hulk. In, in the TV show, it was definitely not his face. It was an animated Hulk face that looked very similar. I, th I think it was an image from the 2003 movie. So yeah, they were hoping that that would boost. Yeah. Now, let's see. Then there are IMDb reviews. Now, I ended up not actually reading these. And I mean, IMDb today is actually you know, the, they used to have the, the, let's see, until fairly recently, they had for a while had this bad setup, and I, you know, I th yeah, I think where you couldn't tell it to place in a s certain order, the, yeah, the, the, let's see, hmm. yeah, you, you couldn't change the all order where it would be like, you know, whether you want them alphabetically or, you know, most, you know, most votes for or whatever. I think they very recently changed that back to, you know, the, the smart way, where you can change that. So, you know, if you want to read, I, you know, let's see, there are about 30 pages, you know, Word document pages worth of, of reviews. So, yeah, if you want to read those, you know, they're, they're there. Let's see, is there anything, like, in closing that... I think that 
ultimately it was just if if they had gone for a more modern excuse me and more dark and serious tone i think it could have worked but if you had done that you i think most of the cast would have had to be i mean they're not they're not all really so certainly the the every every single bad guy actor in this would have had to be recast or they would have had to give a very different performance at least and yeah but i i do think that it could have been it could have been more successful but i'm kind of glad it's not because i really really love the mcu and yeah if this had been a success it would have been very very different but yeah i mean the you know the the heroes all wear black leather in this in blade in x-men you know so it's not yeah it, it's the the let's see you know that's that's consistent across but yeah i enjoy watching it and uh, if this hadn't been if like if this had been something similar then i would have liked to see it prosper i would have i would probably enjoy watching like several seasons worth of of this if it was just not you know if they didn't have the the all these characters that like yeah it's it's really wild to rewatch after all this time especially because you know yeah when i last watched it you know i believe 2009 but let me just look up to me absolutely certain yeah you know back then yeah, I had I had met the the new, you know, we had seen him on film. We'd seen Sam Jackson's Nick Fury on film, and it was it was very clear that the MCU was going to be very different from this show. So, yeah, watching it again, ten years later, and actually being able to compare, you know, all these characters who were. You know, I'd read about a lot of these characters in the books, but I hadn't seen good live-action adaptations of them. And, yeah. I, th I think that's pretty much it. I, I do, it's, it's, it's enjoyable to watch, but it, you know, clearly... I don't know if it was, if it's an issue of talent or whether they didn't want, excuse me, my back. An issue of talent or budget or willingness or what, but definitely the the fights, you know, the, the action scenes themselves could be more convincing and more compelling. But basically everything around those is is fun. Oh, the action, it's not, it's not not fun, it's just not fun in the way that an action scene should be, you know, it's, it's fine, it's underwhelming. I mean, that's another thing, the, the X-Files not, that's not really action based, is it? It's really, it's, it's, okay, again, I'm not saying anything negative about X-Files, but isn't that more a kind of mystery and like, investigation almost kind of thing i mean this yeah you know a bunch of uh, a lot of people run around firing guns in this so yeah if you know if, if this is if the director didn't wasn't very familiar with that that is something action scenes are something that's very difficult to to get right if you you know that's something that takes practice unless you're a russo brother in which case it's 
I still, it's still baffling to me that right from the start their output has been so amazing. But, yeah. Let's see. I, yeah, that pretty much covers that. I, I think ultimately the, the movie is what you would expect it to be if you know the people involved in making it and you know when it was made and on what budget it was made, you know, yeah. But yeah, so in a couple of days, it's Avengers Endgame and I can't wait. Tickets are ordered and yeah, I, I cannot wait. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm kind of glad for, for, what's it called? For perspective, like, you know, William Hurt says, William Hurt's Ross character says in Civil War, you know, for, for perspective's sake, it's nice to have watched this again before watching this, so to really compare how, how far we've come and how, yeah, if, if you look at the comic, this was very much what they, they had back then, and it was just, they didn't do that much to update it. They didn't, and that's the thing, I mean, there have also been really bad updates. You know, there, there are movies that try to say, well, okay, let's, let's divorce it from where it was in the comics, and let's do something very new with it, and something that fits today, and then that doesn't work so well, so... It's, it's difficult, you know. I mean, certainly the uh, Tim Burton's two Batman movies, they were, you know, the, the first one definitely made this kind of, you know, made a live action adaptation of a comic book character respectable again and something that people didn't giggle at. But they're also fairly different from the books in, in some very major ways so yeah anyway i think that's gonna cover it and just yeah i i when when you look at i mean in the comics hydra is this like big you know thing also so it makes a lot of sense to have her overact like that the you know the 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 leader of Hydra would be such a major overactor. That, yeah, it makes a lot of sense for the. Yeah. So I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I'll catch you next time.